welcome to the Wiki Tree Challenge. Hello, I'm Mindy Silva, and welcome to the Wiki Tree Challenge Highlights Livecast. Today I have Melanie McComb and David Lambert with me from the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And I also have Karen Lowe, who was the captain for the Challenge Week. Welcome, guys. Thank you. So, yes. Thank you. And for those of you that um, don't know a lot about Wikitree, I'm going to talk a little bit about it first. For those people, our mission is to grow one accurate shared tree that connects us all and is accessible to everyone free forever. It's all about collaboration. There's one profile per person. If you and I share an ancestor, we work on it together. There is no, you have your tree and I have my tree. And did I mention it's all free? We just passed 34 million uh, profiles, uh, a big milestone for us, with more than 11 million of those having DNA connections attached to them. And what really makes Wikitree work is its community. A cornerstone of the community is our honor code. Anyone can view profiles on Wikitree, <laughs> but to edit more than close family member profiles, you have to sign the honor code. It emphasizes sourcing, giving credit, courtesy, understanding, accessibility, accuracy, and respecting privacy. Privacy is another aspect of Wikitree that makes it special. Even though we're growing a one world tree and we all collaborate, only close family members can collaborate on modern family profiles. As you go back in time, the privacy controls open up. Collaboration on deep ancestors is between cousins who are serious about genealogic research, careful about sources, and willing to see their research validated or invalidated with DNA. So if you aren't a member yet, come and join us. It just takes a minute to register as a guest and you can delete a guest account at any time. Now, this was our seventh Wikitree Challenge of the year, and boy, we just had a blast with this. Uh, we partnered with the New England Historic Genealogical Society, and um, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of support for this, and Wikitreeers were just really overall excited. So we had seven names that they gave us. We had seven days to find everyone we could within seven degrees, and seven degrees means seven steps in any direction. On Wikitree, we call that a person CC7. So that's their connection count within seven degrees. Now, our starting people were Charles Ewer, who gained 4,122 relatives. Um, Lemuel Shattuck, who gained 6,325 relatives. Governor John Albion Andrew, who gained 3,551 relatives. Mary Martha Corrine, she went by Koki. Boggs Roberts, who gained 579 relatives. Kenneth Alford, who gained 307 relatives. And that was a big one because we were wondering how many we were going to add to those lines. We knew they'd be difficult. Uh, Lucy Hall Greenlaw, who gained 5,352 relatives. And Julia Winter Folsom, who gained 3,894 relatives. Now, of course, some of these were new profiles and some of these we just were, uh, you know, able to connect over and over again to existing branches. So, Melanie or David, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you chose the seven, seven starting people and a little bit about your organization? You want to tell them about the ladies? ladies sure, first? I'll tell them about the ladies. So, with the ladies, uh, we have uh, Ju uh, Lucy Greenlaw and Julia Folsom. They are the first, uh, first couple members of NHS when women were admitted to the organization. There actually is a little bit of debate on who was first um, because uh, Lucy was recognized as the first and kind of being elected and being the, the, primary per the primary person within the group in terms of on the roles. But uh, Julia had argued that she was first because her husband paid the dues first. So it kind of gets to <laughs> What comes first, the money or the money or the paper trail in terms of like, you know, what's what's gonna be it. So there's, you know, thought that would be a fun thing to kind of highlight some of our um, some of our ladies that led the way for a lot of female genealogists. And we actually even have the papers of uh, of Lucy Greenlaw here because she was the editor of the genealogical advertiser. So she has all this correspondence and she even worked on a, a genealogy as well. Um, in terms of the other ladies, uh, we also had Koki Roberts, um, who is our NEHS honoree. 
And so we have lots of people that are in the his, uh, history field and other parts of the um, the mainstream where we bring them in and we honor them for their contributions. Um, so Cokie Roberts, I know, has been very involved with different projects in history, and I think also with the National Archives. So, you know, she was, thought she would be a nice one to highlight. And she had a, I think she had a lot of interesting, you know, ancestors in her tree, people were researching. Good. And of course, one of the things with an organization, NEHS uh, started back in 1845. And so we chose our first president and vice president. And Charles Ewer was our first president. Our first vice president was Lemuel Shattuck. Uh, so we thought that they would be interesting because the technology today that's available was not available in the middle of the 19th century when NEHS started. So to look at something on their tree seemed fascinating. I thought we'd see and maybe find out we're related to them somehow too, which is kind of fun. Yeah. Um, the other one we chose was John Albion Andrew, who was the governor of Massachusetts during the time of the Civil War <clears throat> and was our president after the Civil War. Um, he lived shortly after that. Didn't He lived, died in his 50s, sadly. Uh, and the last one was a gentleman who was an African-American veteran from World War II. Do you want to add a little bit more about him? Sure. So Kenneth Alford is someone I actually came across a few years ago. So we used to do a social media series where we had like an NEHS like library item of the month. And so I wanted to look at something that was a little bit more recent uh, 20th century. So our senior archivist, Judy Lucy, had recommended, why don't you look at Kenneth Alford's papers? And it was kind of the perfect example because he has all these great vital records, military records, even some history on his mom's family. And it was just a nice way to show like um, family papers in a more contemporary aspect. And, uh, you know, he was a very interesting guy in that he was the uh, first uh, African-American man from Massachusetts to be in the Marines during World War II. So we wanted to honor him as part of that service as well. And his papers actually are used as a very good educational tool ever since we really uh, came across them a few years ago and we use them a lot with school groups and scouts to show them like here here's how you can explore like an archive papers and how make it more accessible to them and then they use those to basically build out their story and see what they can find out and just a little bit of a quick story about NEHGS um, we've been around since 1845 so 178 years and we're located in Boston uh, at 101 Newbury Street currently we're closed because we're undergoing a multi-million dollar renovation and actually adding on to the building, putting in a great discovery center. Uh, and of course our website, AmericanAncestors.org has over uh, a billion searchable records. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of constituent members of the organization um, and sometimes it's multi-generational. Um, and with genealogy, we have a chance to go around the country uh, and meet our members and lecture uh, and do publications. So we're a very multifaceted uh, organization and we serve more than just the old title of New England. Uh, we've expanded our brand to be American ancestors to try to be all things for all people. So regardless if your ancestor came over in 1620 or your Native American that came over thousands of years ago, or if your ancestors just came over last week, uh, American ancestors will help you discover your story. Yeah, and that's something that, you know, I heard repeatedly from the members is that they've gotten so much out of your organization. Wow. They're like, yeah, you know, they're like, oh, I had to jump at the chance to, you know, pay them back just a little bit even. Oh, I love that. Yeah, we really love yeah. that. Members really felt an attachment and wanted to give back. So we really appreciate all of our members and maybe future members so that you want right. to help us. I think I it's for the whole staff that we appreciate all that you've done and the excitement uh, in being part of this. Yes. So thank you in advance. Yeah. Yes. And as another current member of, uh, of American Ancestors, thanks so much uh, from me. It was really fun to see how many of our wiki triers are already members and how many of the um, NEHGS members wanted to come and see what Wikitree was all about and join us in the challenge. Great. Great. Yeah, and that's exactly what our outreach, you know, this year is doing is we want to we want to promote some of these other groups. We want to get more members out to you guys. And, you know, it also increases awareness for Wikitree. So, Karen, do you want to go ahead and um, talk a little bit about who worked on the challenge this week. Right. Um, our MVP, of course, was Margaret um, Meredith. And uh, we've seen Homer uh, be a top bounty hunter and an MVP of the challenge 
uh, more than once. So so that was fun um, to see Homer back back in the lead again. Um, Chris was our Chris O'Connell was our rookie trier who uh, was also a top bounty hunter. I'm thinking that he and Cheryl and and uh, M. Cole may have just um, all had you know similar numbers of, of points this week. Um, and, and of course there's there's me, your your team captain for the week. Um, it's really fun to uh, you, you know many of us pay no attention to the scoreboard and others of us, it's motivating to say, oh, if I just add five more people, I can, uh, I can pass by Melanie or Mindy or whoever it is that is right at our level of contributions. It just feeds into our addictiveness on Wiki Tree, anyways. You know, it's always that, ooh, if I just can add five more before I go to bed. <laughs> and you can't stop. No, and you need an incentive sometimes. You're right. So no, and we don't even stop. Um, you know, when the challenge ends, I'm just looking at how um, Kenneth Alford has another twenty people in his relations um, since Thursday, and and uh, Kofi Roberts. I'm sure everyone has has some more, and you can see how very many people uh, participated. I'm seeing names that I recognize as. Longtime members, members from Europe uh, and other places that is so valuable when we get into uh, places and uh, languages that are out of our expertise. It's so great to have someone to call upon uh, to give us a hand. And I see Emma McBeath and, and I know uh, Kate Schmidt and others from the U.S. Black Heritage Project uh, we're happy to join us and bring their expertise for uh, for an area of genealogy that can be very difficult for folks working with Black heritage here in the U.S. So uh, we were so happy to have their help as well. Yeah, and a lot of new ones to the challenge, so that was fun. We had more than 117 people that participated. Yeah. So yeah. Like Way more than we people signed up, but over 117 actively participated and made points right. during the week. That's um, great. It was a good week. And I know some others did valuable work that just wasn't adding people within seven degrees or breaking down a big brick wall or having the most interesting story. So those folks who don't show up on the board are valuable to us as well. Absolutely, and thank you all. And I'm sure that it's gonna help me increase everybody's CC7 too as well, hopefully with some of those early roots as well, you know. Yeah. Yes, our, um, we love to look at how many people are within seven degrees, whether it's a parent-child relationship or a spouse uh, relationship or sibling, uh, to see how many closer relations we can, we can add to our tree. It's fascinating because John Andrew would have known Lemuel Shattuck by association. Mm -hmm. uh, Shattuck died about a decade before, so I, I bet you they never made that connection. <laughs> yeah, I bet not. It's fun, though, to see, you know, how they all, the connections are made once we start doing all these branches. And, of course, I mean, we had record-breaking numbers, David, for this week, record-breaking for the challenge for the year. And some of the numbers actually topped the prior year uh, mm -hmm. for this week's challenge. But because the branches were so huge, you know, it was really easy to get all of these people connected somehow. And, you know, we connected them in more ways than one. So you can see John Andrew. John Andrew had a lot of connections and he had a ton of interesting people too, uh, you know, but then you also see like Lemuel was uh, connected to Cokie Roberts and that isn't something we were looking for. Yes. Yeah. yeah. By 18 generations, that one is not degrees. So that means they're actually related. Wow. Um, yeah, distant cousins. And all of those are generations instead of degrees. Now we did have, I think we had a couple that were, um, yeah, Lemuel also had four connections that were within 20 degrees. So that means uh, related by marriage. And, so basically all of our other starting, most all of our starting profiles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so he was our outliers, with, right? Would be Private Alfred, and then uh, who else? Left, you know, was was more distantly related to these folks. 
Well, I think, you know, those are the main ones that w were really close. So like Charles had a lot of connections. Um, John definitely had a lot of connections. Lemuel had a lot of connections. I think some of the ladies, uh, their stuff was like way more distantly out there than mm -hmm. what the guys were. So, you know, Lucy was connected to John within 15 generations and she was actually his fifth cousin three times removed. Oh. So, you know, but I think that was like the closest connection we found for Lucy. She was, she was kind of out there, but yeah, it's fun to bring up. And I tell you what, I always do this, like when I'm checking what everybody's telling me and I'll go, okay, so John connected to Lucy. And so I bring John up and it goes, oh, he's your fifth cousin once removed, Mindy. <laughs> and then I take my ID to whoever I'm really comparing him to. Um, I have a lot of cousins on this list too. So it was fun. Yeah, and, and for myself, um, I don't think of myself as a New Englander. You know, I think of so, uh, as myself of someone with Midwest and um, Southern Appalachian roots. Uh, but it doesn't take long to realize that no, I have I have pilgrims and Puritans in the family as well. So that connects me to all of these folks. And then, uh, you know, once you start adding in the degrees, where we consider the marital, uh, the the spouse connections as well. Well, we just have to keep adding a few more people before we find that magic brother-in-law of uh, Private Alfred, and he gets just as close as the rest of us. And then here you go, David. We have a lot of fun. We do have a lot of fun with that connection fighter to see who's the closest. Wow. So this is your connection to Governor Albion. Um, it shows you the path used to reach him with him being your sixth cousin four times removed. And coincidentally, you're 18 generations, not degrees, you're 18 generations from Lucy Hall Greenlaw, who is also your sixth cousin four times removed. Oh, that's cool. I nice. feel that this is nepotism now that our choice is it wasn't intentional. <laughs> I know. I know. I was waiting for somebody to go, oh, that's why they picked them. <laughs> As a, uh, a former Civil War reenactor from Massachusetts, knowing that our former governor was my distant cousin it gives me a little bit more shine to my brass on my buttons so thank you <laughs> and then we couldn't leave melanie's out so of course she was um 17 degrees from lemuel shattuck and 19 degrees from governor john albium andrew so um it's connected by marriage but still really cool to be able to see those connections very cool, very cool. That's pretty good for someone who doesn't have New England ancestors, <laughs> really. So, yeah. Right. And here we looked at the connections to the fourth governor of Massachusetts, and the closest ones were Lemuel Shattuck at 10 generations, uh, their third cousins twice removed, Lucy Hall Greenlaw at 17 generations, their fifth cousins five times removed. Charles Ewer is connected in eight degrees, so related by marriage and uh, Governor John Albion Andrew is uh, at 11 degrees, so related by marriage. Excellent. Now, here was our first starting person that you gave us, Charles Ewer. He was born about 1790 in Boston, Massachusetts. His parents were Silas Ewer and Nancy Armstrong. He started work in the book business first in Portsmouth, but soon returned to Boston, and by 1828 worked there for the publisher, Timothy Bedlington. Early in 1845, he participated in the founding of the New England Historical Genealogic Society and was elected as its first president, having long lobbied for its creation. So we have to get a lot, give a lot of thanks to Charles here because I don't know what we do without you guys. <laughs> um, three degrees from him, we found Isaiah Thomas LLD. Now he was born in 1749 in Boston. He was a printer, a patriot, an editor, an author, and a philanthropist who was known for publishing the Massachusetts Spy. He founded the Antiquarian Society of Worcester and authored the History of Printing. So it was just fun to find another cousin that, you know, was into publishing and had some of the same interests. Although Isaiah is three degrees from Charles via his wife, they're also 17th cousins by blood 
And, you know, it just blows my mind that Wikitree will look that far out and go, oh, you're like 26 cousins five times removed. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I know the computers can do it, but the, the thing that the techs have actually sat down and told it to look for those connections is crazy. Yeah, that's got to use some server time. And, and of course, when we get this far back, we're like, come and take a look and prove us wrong. You know, we want the tree to be accurate. And yeah. Uh, so so i always look askance when we start to get into the medieval period uh and and so should you you know so come and come and straighten us out if we've gone astray yeah now we have jariah bass here and during the american revolutionary war uh edward seville who later became his brother-in-law and a cousin nathaniel bill were privateers working on behalf of the patriot cause on the ship essex the ship was captured in 1781 in the English Channel. They were jailed in England, along with several other men from Braintree, for a number of months, and ultimately were released from British custody due to intervention of John Adams. And, you know, just really interesting to see that it's, uh, they were all related like that and still able to stay in service together. Next, we have Lemuel Shattuck. In 1835, he authored A History of the Town and Concord. In 1841, he compiled The Vital Statistics of Boston. He was a Boston City Alderman in July of 1849, appointed a councilman, and later the president of the Northeast Female Medical College. So throughout his life, he was really committed to contributing to his community and also documenting the lives of his fellow countrymen. And one of our researchers was, you know, just looking into him and found it really interesting that at least two of his daughters died of consumption, one in 1850, one in 1851, and, you know, wondered if their illnesses may have precipitated his pioneering work in creating the public health system, which had a particular focus on consumption and other communicable diseases. Now here we have Mr. Ebenezer Ball. He's an interesting man. Um, he was a soldier during the Revolutionary War serving in Captain James Hosley's company, Colonel William Prescott's regiment, which marched on the alarm of April 19, 1775. And though he lived a long life, dying at the age of 21 in Townsend, Massachusetts, his poor wives just did not fare the same. And so he first married Ms. Sarah Shattuck amidst the American Revolution. He was 25, she was about 26. Their daughter, Sarah, was born about a year later. And then Sarah died two years after that in 1785 at the age of 30. And unfortunately, we couldn't find what her cause of death is. Uh, you know, but in those times, it could have been a number of things. Now, Ebenezer next married Hannah Smith in 1786. And Ebenezer was 29 now, Hannah was 26. Hannah died in 1787, just two days after the birth of their son, Ebenezer. And, you know, terribly tragic, but I really see a pattern here. And, you know, they name one after the first wife and she dies. And then they name a child after him and that child dies or, you know, the wife dies. Um, just a lot of tragedy around these children that they named after them. So I think I would have been a little bit afraid of that, but, uh, but it didn't stop them. And in October of 1787, now twice a widower with two young children, Ebenezer married Phoebe Weston. He and Phoebe had eight children together. They were named David, Levi, Hosea, Phoebe, Samuel, Hannah, Roxanna, and Varnum. But Phoebe lived to a lovely age of 80. So I guess they broke the little curse that was on their family of naming the children on them. But I definitely would have been concerned for little Phoebe you know, and also for Big Phoebe after they had had such tragedy strike their lives. Now, Ebenezer Ball Jr. and Lemuel, Lemuel Shattuck are three degrees apart, being fourth cousins once removed. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, again, we just found that a lot in here. We found a lot of connections, which is unusual for the challenge this year. Uh, you know, sometimes we try super hard to make connections between the starting people and we just don't find them. But we had a lot of connections this time. 
right, with all these connections in uh, colonial Massachusetts, you know, there's only so many people there to pick to marry. <laughs> Very true. Now, here was another tragic one, you know, and unfortunately, sometimes that is what you see. If they're not wealthy or political, um, you know, something tragic has to happen or they don't make the news. But we do have people that scour through the papers just trying to find stuff. And, you know, on this flip side, where the last gentleman lived to such a long age, we have Richard Morgan Wadsworth, Richie, and he died of carbon monoxide poisoning from a faulty heater on his yacht. He's oh. 17 generations from Lemuel Shattuck, being his sixth cousin, three times from <laughs> And Richard was only 28 years old. Wow. Now we have Susanna. Susanna Shattuck Moore's Faye Brigham. That's quite a name. She was married first to Richard Norcross, second to Joseph Moore's, and third to John Faye. And in the Faye genealogy, John Fay of Marlborough and his descendants, which was written back in 1898, it states that with the descendants of the Brigham, Shattuck, and Faye families, blood has mingled through every generation for the past 250 years. Um, that's a long time to be mixing up some family blood. That's a really long time. <laughs> You know, and you see, though, I mean, all kinds of different cultures where people stay within family lines or they stay within religious groups or they stay within class structures. And so you do wind up with a lot of those intermarriages. Um, but still, right. uh, 250 is a long time. Yeah. That was Hopefully the biologists have been telling us that it's not as dangerous as we might have thought. Now, Susanna is seven generations from Lemuel Shattuck, being his third great-grand-aunt. She's also eight degrees from Governor Andrew, nine degrees from Charles Ewer, and ten degrees from Lucy Greenlaw. Next, we had the governor, John Albion Andrew. He was born in 1818 in Wyndham, Massachusetts. He was the governor of Massachusetts from 1860 to 1866. And he formed the famous 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry, which was the first regiment in the United States made up entirely of enlisted, you know, enlisted men of color. And even once those were established, you know, there weren't a whole lot of them, but they're definitely, um, they started to, to build those up. John was said to be a remarkable speechwriter and speaker. His paternal grandfather, John Andrew, was a silversmith during the American Revolution, the same as Paul Revere. So that was just kind of an interesting little tidbit of news. Then we have Adeline Ripley on his lines, and this one was um, kind of fun. It was Adeline Neeland Ripley. Angie Neeland Ripley and Daniel Simpson Ripley were all born in 1829. Their parents were O'Shea Ripley and Mary Clark Ripley. Well, when the triplets were born, the doctor, Daniel Lang Simpson, MD, strongly mm -hmm. urged the parents to name them after himself, his wife, and his sister. So the wife was Angeline Neeland. The sister was Adeline Neeland. And of course, he was Daniel Simpson. And so they did. They named all three of their children. Um, they didn't even get to pick the middle names. They used the other person's birth name as the middle name for their children. And, mm. yeah. I mean, talk about thanking your doctor. <laughs> wow. maybe, maybe there was no cost involved in the delivery. Yeah, that's what I wondered. Just kind of <laughs> of <laughs> right, I hope they got yeah. a discount. Well, my husband has some people like that in his branches, you know, maybe where they took one of the names and put it as a middle name. But I mean, I that's a little bit excessive. The first name in there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the idea of triple being born though, even at that time, was probably very unusual, and yeah. especially and if they're surviving. all survived. Though. Surviving, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the doctor was probably patting himself on the back for how healthy the triplets were, when that's probably more thanks to the mother. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And Adeline Ripley and her siblings are seven degrees from Governor John Andrew. So um, fun to look at, at those connections. Now, next we had twins. So we had some multiple births just scattered all throughout the branches out there. These twins were uh, unique because they were born two days apart. 
And I'll tell you what, the researcher had to stop and look at that more than twice. <laughs> she kept thinking maybe somebody had a date wrong on something. And no, the twins were born two days apart. So you have Clement Gleason and Clifford Gleason were born on the 13th and the 15th of August in 1875. Both twins and the mother survived. They're a blood relation through the Gleason line to Lemuel Shattuck and seven degrees from John Andrew. Um, Clement's army enlistment shows that he joined the hospital corps and then he later died of typhoid fever in 1898. Can you imagine that poor woman though, two days apart? I mean. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. I'd say, um, you need to fix that. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. Now, here we have one that was a little bit unique as well. We have Joseph Augustus Gibson, and he's listed as a painter in the 1850 and 1860 censuses. The Historical Society of Early American Decoration actually has a collection of the stencils that he used to decorate homes around the New Ipswich, New Hampshire area. And so, you know, I guess he was famous for his stencils that he put on people's houses. Joseph is six degrees or 12 generations from John Albion Andrew being his fifth cousin. And according to the Stedman Family's Research Center, Joseph was living at Gibson Village in the house just south of the mill pond. So I guess you have to know the area because I don't know where the mill pond is. But, but he was <laughs> And his children constituted a very musical family, some of his daughters forming a concert troupe known as the Gibson Sisters. So very creative, artistic family. Next, we have Mary Martha Kareen Koki Boggs Roberts, and she received her nickname of Koki as her brother Thomas could not pronounce her name when he was a child. By 1992, she served as a senior news analyst and commentator for the National Public Radio, and she was their congressional correspondent for more than a decade. For her work, she won the prestigious Edward R. Morrow event, the Everett McKinley Dirksen Award, and an Emmy in 1991 for her work on a profile for Ross Perot. So yeah, um, not an overachiever at all. Definitely somebody to look up to, right? No. Yeah, uh, and I know I just I, an I, Emmy, I'll just throw it there with the rest of my awards. <laughs> I had the honor to meet her a few years ago and a very, very delightful lady. Very oh, sad great. we've lost her. Yeah, I arrived at work uh, well informed about the events of the day, you know, many mornings, thanks to Kofi Roberts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were several of the, the people in the research group that were just super excited. They got to work on her family lines, really excited and really honored. Now, she her branches had some really well traveled relatives. And here we have Norbert Clay, Claiborne and who he managed a sugar plant in South America. So he married in Argentine and had four children in Argentina. After his wife died, he brought his children back to Louisiana in the United States, where they all were successful with their lives. He had lived in Tahiti, Cuba, Mexico, and Colombia, as well as his 40 years in Argentina. Norbert is four generations from Koki, being her grand uncle. Another relative in the sugar industry, and that's not necessarily a common industry either, so it was fun to find too, was mm -hmm. Emery Moore. Now, he was living in Violeta, Cambaguay, Cuba in 1952 with his wife, where he managed a sugar company. He died suddenly, and his sister, who was back in the United States, of course, requested the FBI to investigate his death. Now, they investigated and found it to be of natural causes. And his uh, body was returned to be interred in New Orleans. He's five degrees from Koki Roberts. But that would be hard on the family, you know, to have somebody pass like that. And I mean, they're an entirely different country. You don't know how they've been doing. You don't really know what happened, um, how honest they are with their reporting practices. Sure. 
Yes, and not ready to lose your brother when he's only 58 years old. Yeah. This lady was really cool, too, and she is Lewis Robertson, but Cunningham Barrett Meyer, uh, who was born in 1877 in Augusta, Georgia. And she has um, what I always said about my dad. He just had a big heart. You know, he just wanted to share it with everyone. So she had uh, she had many marriages, but an incredible woman. She actually became the owner and publisher of a significant newspaper, the Birmingham Age Herald when her husband died in 1922, but she continued to successfully run it. Her son, Edward Ware Barrett, graduated from Princeton in 1932, and he had a remarkable life as a journalist and the Dean of Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and more. Now, Lewis remarried to Edward Barrett, who was also a journalist and the owner of the Birmingham H. Herald, her third husband, Robert Meyer, was an entrepreneur who built and owned many hotels. And, you know, just between his obituary and his fine and grave profile, they found, uh, you know, they said he was quite the businessman as well as a philanthropist. And Lewis is six degrees from Cokie Roberts. And our system did not like the spelling of this name. And this is how her name was spelled. So it kept <laughs> going, oh, Lewis was the son of, and I go, no, daughter, daughter. <laughs> And somebody would make an edit and it'd go, oh, Lewis is the son. No, Lewis is not the son. Um, Lewis was just an incredible lady that, you know, had great control over her life and, and did a lot with it. Now, fifth was Kenneth Alford. And, he, you know, he came from modest beginnings. In the 1920 census, he was five years old and enumerated as the son of William Alford. His father was working as a janitor at a book binding facility. Kenneth enlisted in the United States Marine Corps on August 16, 1943. He trained at Camp Montford Point in North Carolina, making him one of the Montford Point Marines, the first black Marines who served during World War II and who had all trained at the segregated Camp Montford Point. By the time he was discharged in January 1946, he had been promoted to sergeant. You know, so just like, I, you know, all the people that you guys gave us uh, were breaking through something and, you know, being starters, uh, putting societies together or being the first woman in an organization. He was, too. He was out there being a Marine and showing, you know, that he could be an officer just like the next guy. Now, here was somebody in his branches, and, you know, unfortunately, you just did see this sometimes, but Thomas Alford went to the Freedmen's Bureau in December of 1865 in Robeson County, North Carolina, asking them to order Zachariah Cade Fulmore to allow his family to leave. So when we looked at the records, you know, we found that um, Fulmore had enslaved the Alford family, but when the Civil War had come to an end and he was supposed to free them, he did not want to. Oh. And so, yeah. And, you know, and so Thomas had to go to the Freedmen's Bureau and say, look, you need to tell him to let my family go. And, you know, from what we can tell, the communications with him and the Fulmars were not um, overly pleasant. But, and they wound up in living next to him. By the time the 1870 census came around, his family was with him and they were living on the farm next to Fulmore. So I don't know what happened there, if that was convenience or if that was, you know, things got better. I don't know. But it was interesting to note that instead of taking Fulmore's surname, once they were freed, which a lot of the enslaved people did, they actually took the name of the town that they lived in. So for the Alfords, their name came from the town Alfordsville oh, wow. in North Carolina. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Very cool discovery. Well, especially yeah. since we didn't really know anything about uh, Kenneth's father's family. There was almost nothing in his papers that we have with him. We're all focused really on just him, his wife, and his mother's line. There was almost nothing on the father. We didn't even have a death certificate even for him. So that's great that you'd be able to take this back. I see this is going to have to be printed out, put in a folder in the archives of the rest of his papers. Yep, I think so. Yeah, because that's the origin of the name there. I mean, that's, you yeah. know, that's the big thing. Right. 
And like I said, you know, with enslaved people, we always, of course, have difficulties once you hit back to that era where they didn't have last names and, you know, they didn't have birth records and the normal things that we would have to track our relatives, you may not have for them. So for the teams to come up with more than 300 people to attach to his lines, Kenneth Alford's lines was just incredible. And, you know, and I do thank the United States Black Heritage Project on Winky Tree for participating and making sure that those lines were successfully researched. Really a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, thank That's you. That's wonderful, thank you. Now, here is the connection. Thomas is three generations from Kenneth Alford, being his great-grandfather. So this was a, in a direct line. Yeah. Excellent. Now we have Lucy Greenlaw. She was our sixth person that you provided to us. Uh, Lucy, age 23, child of Allen and Sarah Hall, married William Prescott Greenlaw in 1892 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She was a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution and belonged to the Chapter 1029 MA, a Massachusetts chapter. Her husband was a librarian and treasurer of the New England Historic Society. Lucy died in Massachusetts at the age of 92. Um, nice. Must have had some incredible stories to tell. And this one was interesting, George Norris Woodward. So he's out on Lucy's branches and he was a doctor and a surgeon born in New Hampshire and but raised in New York. But in 1858, he decided to go out to the Rocky Mountains for the Colorado gold rush. So he was gonna go get him some gold. <clears throat> and he got, he got out there and decided that treating patients was much more lucrative than panning for gold because of course there were no doctors set up you know there were just all these uh gold hungry people people with gold fever out there and he wound up serving as a surgeon for the union side of the civil war before settling in boone county illinois and the little snippets on there are part of the letter that he wrote to his brother you'll have to read the entire thing on the uh, profile but Sorry. interesting to say, you know, when he gets to it and he tells his brother, he says, I do not think I shall do much at gold digging. My time is worth more in taking care of the lame and lazy at $10 per visit. I should be extremely <laughs> glad to hear from you all. I hope my doctor doesn't write about me like that to his brother. I know. And I went, oh, goodness. Yeah, I hope people weren't like reading his letter to everyone. Oh, yeah, my brother's out there taking care of all the lame people. So it's all good. The lame yeah. and lazy. Yeah. And, the and lame I feel and bad, the lazy. Feel bad for the one woman in that area, too. Yeah, she yeah. must have had a big stick. <laughs> yeah, it was talking, of course, about all the cabins and the 200 men that were in that gold camp. And there was one lady. I just can't even imagine. I just I absolutely can't imagine. I mean, she was brave, <laughs> but, you know, for one thing, why did she go when nobody else went? I don't know. Now, Lucy Greenlaw and George Woodard are eight generations apart, not degrees, so they're a direct relation, him being her second cousin, twice removed. But it is interesting. He talks about the migration trail that they took, you know, and how they went through Arkansas and they went up 125 miles north and then we cut across it this way. And, you know, except for the comment about the lame and lazy, it was kind of an interesting letter to read. <laughs> now, this person, Rachel McBain Petrie, she's an example of how our research just takes us around the globe. And, you know, we love that. I mean, our, our members for Wikitree are global, of course, anyways. And our Discord chat, the live chat that we use, it goes around the clock in multiple channels. Um, you know, but it's just fun that you can sit at home now and, you know, something you couldn't do when we all started out, huh? Um, you couldn't just sit at home and do all this research. You had to go drive somewhere and look at microfilm and dig out, <laughs> dig through the card files and yeah. Um, but you know, now we have the pleasure of being able to do this. So Miss Rachel and her husband, William Petrie, he was a Scottish granite or stone cutter. They resided in Russia for a few years. So some of their children were actually born there in Russia. Now, after Rachel's death in 1881, their daughter, Daisy Petri Hearsey, at the age of one, was adopted by her older sister, Jessie. And uh, 
her husband, Samuel Greenlaw. So that was just an interesting connection, you know, and it was great that she had a sibling that was that much older that could step in mm -hmm. and, and take her to lose your mother at age one. It was just terrible. Yeah. Rachel Petrie and Lucy Greenlaw are just four degrees apart. And then last but not least was Julia Winter Folsom. She married Albert A. Folsom in 1861 in Boston, Massachusetts. She was one of the first uh, female members of the New England Historic Genealogical Society, which, of course, was founded, like you said, in 1845. Mm -hmm. Well, and we found this lady out on her branches. Sarah Sally Atwood Dobson created a stir in 1823 when she confronted the Worthington Congregational Church in Connecticut with a list of six written reasons why she disagreed with what the church was teaching. Oh. Two male members attempted to endeavor to enlighten her mind and convince her of her error, but I guess they failed. So she then joined the Methodist Church where she was disappointed for wearing a bonnet with a ribbon. Oh boy. It sounds like she should have gone to Rhode Island. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere else. Yeah. Now I want to look and see if she descends from Ann Hutchinson, who was also known for the church. I was uh, going to say. Yeah. yeah, and this is the 19th century. century. This is yeah. later. You think it would be a little bit more, you know, a little more accepting. I guess not. Yeah, a little more relaxed. Yeah. Definitely a feisty woman, though, and I'll tell you what, I have a few of those in my family, so. <laughs> I'd be uh, curious, can... now, you went into a Methodist church now with a bonnet and ribbon. How would you be, how would they react? Oh, I, I think <laughs> you're going to be challenged right here. Are you going to wear a bonnet and a ribbon going Oh, my mother-in-law is actually a Methodist. I'm curious so there's, so what, what the reasoning was with that. You, have, felt, to, you like, have to ask her to wear it one day. I would yeah. think acceptable about covering the hair and not and like not covering would be more i think you know, it's the ribbon it's the excessiveness of uh, long time. right that you should be humble before god or something right uh, yeah today i think you know the other ladies you know, would I'm just right? have bigger ribbons yeah it's true now, Miss Sally Atwood, Dobson, and Julia Folsom are 14 degrees apart so it does switch by marriage a couple of times on that connection Okay. And we see that every time the color changes in that chain, right? <laughs> Next, we have George Cocaine. He was also out on, on her lines. And he first married to Millicent Gregory. The marriage was declared null and void due to the fact that the couple gave the wrong birth dates. And so both were under the age of 21, and the marriage mm -hmm. only lasted three days. <laughs> Oh, because they were minors. Oh. So they, wait, they gave their own birthdays. Were they like off by a couple days or were they actually under? No, they lied. They just yeah. lied. Because okay. they didn't want to bring, bring lied. consent yeah. from their parents. No French consent for them. Ooh. They probably figured if they could get through the getting it done part, nobody would, you know, say anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Did they ever get back together when they were of age? I don't know if they did. Um, he remarried to somebody else later. So, I mean, he may have stayed with her for a while, but um, yeah. Well, apparently he gave the right age that second time around. <laughs> yeah. Sally Dobson and Julia Folsom are 14 degrees apart. It's not 14, no. And then, of course, whether we support wars or not, our veterans gave uh, their all to support and protect our country. And because of this, we always like to acknowledge at least a few of them. And, you know, it's just so hard to pick. You guys had, there were just so many interesting people in every branch of these, you know, starting people of these trees. Uh, it was just so hard to look through it and go, okay, we're only going to do this. And so I usually only pick one conflict, but we have three. because, <laughs> And even at that, I had to narrow it down. In the American Revolution, we had Jariah Bass, who had revolutionary service in 1776. He later died in military service in the War of 1812. Oh, okay. Young Edward Saville, his son, and a nephew of Jariah Bass died in the Battle of 1812, so they lost several people in that war. Uh, we have George James Yates, who's four degrees from Lucy Greenlaw. He served as a captain with Massachusetts during the American Revolution. 
Captain Yeats is also a DAR Patriot ancestor. Silas Ewer was a Revolutionary War soldier and commissioned to be the commander of the ship Camberwell. Eliezer Flagpole was a lieutenant in the American Revolutionary War. Now, for the Civil War, I have two here. John B. Ireland, who's seven degrees from Lucy Hall, served in the New York 8th Heavy Artillery during the Civil War. He was severely wounded during the Second Battle of Deep Bottom in Deep Bottom, Virginia. George Alfred Cunningham, who graduated West Point in 1857 and was assigned to the 1st Cavalry as a second lieutenant, he resigned from the U.S. Army in 1861 in February, which ended his service for the Union. And then in April, he entered as a colonel the Confederate service. Oh, wait, he entered as a first lieutenant, though, of artillery, and he was promoted for conspicuous services in the battle to Captain Major and then Colonel of Artillery. Now, from the Great World War or World War I, we have the following. We have uh, First Lieutenant George Peyton Cole, who was killed by machine gun fire in the Battle of Argonne Forest in France. And we have General Michael Davison's father, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Root Davison, was a captain with the 15th United States Cavalry, having enlisted in 1912. He served with the Ordnance Department during World War II. So a lot of um, a lot of men out there that committed to their country. Now on WikiTree, we're all cousins by blood or marriage. There are 29,296,146 cousins connected on WikiTree alive or not. And then our time started out in, you know, the United States and of course, New England heavily in Massachusetts. But by the end of the week, we had research in the following locations. And so our team of researchers visited Argentina, Canada, more specifically Nova Scotia, um, Cape Verde Islands, Cuba, England, Honduras, Ireland, Norway, Russia, Scotland, Spain, Massachusetts as a colony, of course, Massachusetts Bay, and in the United States, um, pretty much all of them, I think they listed out. And so it's really, you know, really cool to see the records coming in and conversations going back and forth about all of those different you know, places. And a great thing about WikiTree, though, too, you know, and within the challenge, because we wind up with such a broad spectrum of experience and, you know, skills that we get people that have experience all over the world that come in and help out those of us that don't know an area, you know, and help us learn how to find records. So... If anyone out there has questions about the presentation or WikiTree, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or wikitree.com. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel. I'm going to run the credits for a minute. And, you know, I'd like to take a minute to thank all the incredible WikiTreeers that helped with the research for the week. Once again, we had more than 117 people working on this challenge. They found just an amazing amount of discoveries and a really fun group to work with. And Karen, uh, you know, thank you, too, for making this such a successful week. And then a big thank you to Melanie and David for working with us and, and partnering up and letting us dive into these branches. Yes, and thanks so much to you, Mindy, and the WikiTree team for all their behind-the-scenes uh, work that makes these challenges possible and allows us all to have so much fun researching together. Bravo. Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> you all did wonderful. And we really, Absolutely. And we really appreciate all the time you've spent into each of those profiles. And it sounds like that you said, like different people were uh, gravitating towards a specific person. So I like that there was some variety that everyone felt like they could maybe connect with one of them in some yeah. way. Yes. Even though, um, you know, you would think on the surface, uh, all of these folks were coming from the same place and, and our uh, um, members outside the U.S. would be uninterested. You know, we had record levels of uh, participation and, and then, you know, it didn't take us long to get out of New England and off to certainly to the south. I know we added uh, several categories for uh, African-American folks who had uh, 
participated in the Great Migration, you know, in the mid uh, 20th century. And so we have new categories for people migrating out of North and South Carolina up to Massachusetts. Um, and and so there's, you know, there's so much research to be done. And I'm sure we've already had a number of, uh, you know, graduate papers uh, mm -hmm. that are drawing on research from the tree. Great. That's awesome. Yeah, and I want to show this to you real quick. You know, Karen had mentioned how there are some people still working, and you know, you guys know us from prior challenges. Um, some people just can't quite give it up at the end of the week, and we're still working on it. So, <laughs> this gentleman is one of them, and he actually represented the only brick wall that we did not um, get to give points out for before the week was up. But you know, it was for a reason. And we actually have the parents for him. So they're not added on Wikitree yet. It's Richard Faudry, and he's on the Charles Ewer lines. Um, if you looked out on other sites on, you know, the internet, everybody had him as a brick wall. And at this point now, we have his father, William's will. We have his stepmother, Agnes's will. We have his uncle's will. Um, wow. We're still transcribing all of these wills so that we can get the information put, you know, on the profiles and and fill them out um, appropriately. But it was just one of those things that was really exciting, you know, and it just happened over and over with different little spots of the branches where people just went, oh, I can't believe it, I found, you know. And, yeah, it's just so much fun to look through them and see all of the wonderful things that they, you know, that they found on them and the notes that people left for future researchers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's a good reminder that why you don't, you shouldn't give up with your genealogy, that something might come along mm -hmm. a little bit later and you just never know. So right. don't, say, don't say never, you know. Yeah. It's a never ending story. Go back generations right. and go forward generations. And you were kind of just in the middle. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Somewhere sooner or later, you're going to find it. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> will. Never yeah. give up. Exactly. Never give up. And it also just shows just, just how like this so few connections are needed just to connect us with different people in history and throughout time. So yeah. just you know and we're all a lot more closely related than we think we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We haven't found our cousins yet, have we? No, we haven't found that okay. yet. No. Right. Oh yeah, we can work on that. We'll at least get you uh by by degrees, you know. Yeah, Absolutely. I was gonna say more degrees probably Absolutely. where my family's from. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at our locations. We talked about a lot of them, but um, we wound up in in uh, not just Cuba, which we mentioned, but Cape Verde Islands and Honduras and and Argentina. You know, I'll have to go uh, puzzle out where uh, what took us over there, and then beyond, you know, England, Scotland, Ireland, which you might expect for mm -hmm. um, folks from Massachusetts. We were also, like you said, in Norway and and. Uh, in Spain and in, um, so we got around the world. Yeah, we definitely did. We definitely did. And I think it's a lot of those birds too. All well, the sugar plants and everything else. That's probably yeah. good why we're hopping back to different the Caribbean islands, especially. Oh, that's true. Right to the Caribbean yeah. and and even to South America. So uh, few degrees when you think about how much between the uh, sort of colonists. So mm -hmm. Norway, that's a little out there, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Russia. 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 I mean, those yeah. are those are interesting ones. Yeah, how yeah. they kind of end up there. So. Yeah, and I see twenty nine states added to the list, and that's just the ones that people thought to add to the list. So I bet if we went and looked, we'd find yeah. the other twenty. Yeah, for the United States, over half of them, definitely. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to know the story behind, like how they actually wound up in Russia. You know, did they just decide sometime, hey, I want to go look at? You know, Russia. I know one of the um, one of the ones. I believe it was the doctor in that letter that had just said, you know, who knows where I'll wind up next. I just want to see the world. Yeah. Um, you know, so that was kind of cool. That's great. Fascinating discoveries, as yeah. always. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This is a lot of fun, I'm, I'm, and I'm glad that this was something that everybody felt it was fun to participate in too. So. Yeah. Right. And that spirit of wanting to give back. You know, I know we saw a lot of that in our first year when we were working with uh, genealogists, you, you, you know, and we thought, oh, think of how much, uh, you know, Amy Johnson Crow or Judy Russell or, or you know, David himself or, or uh, and Melanie, of course, um, you know, uh, liked being featured so much that she had to come and join us. <laughs> That's right. I, I, I'm still 
you know, spellbound for yeah. you know what you guys found for me. And that's like I always tell people. I mean, even yeah. more so, I always support a wiki tree and set out what a wonderful thing. As I said, you know, I said. Here I am, the chief genealogist of an organization, and you just cannot rest on the laurels of your own research. Mm -hmm. You have to crowdsource. You have yeah. to compare and share. Yeah. Right. And it really it made a difference in my research. I could, without the wiki tree challenge oh, that sorry. I was involved in, I'd be thinking that James Lee was still <laughs> my ancestor with the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep, yeah, and I love how I get surprised by other people's DNA. You know, I knew that. On paper, I was like a 16th, um, a Quebecer from from uh, New France, and and uh, and then I go and look at my my mom's dad one day, and there's like three French Canadians who are on his um, mitochondrial line, and they all share the same haplogroup. Uh, so it just confirms that you know three people up there joined WikiTree, told us that they had taken a mitochondrial test. And uh, I don't know if I could have gotten my second cousins to take it, but it certainly adds confirmation. Oh, and in fact, um, I did get confirmation because a cousin um, did 23andMe, where they just give you a haplotype, and that was a match. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I know I've seen a few things. Obviously, besides some corrections being made on my line, the corcoran line, um, I'm starting to see possible cousins more and more starting to join now. So I'm actually starting to see actual cousins that are newer to me. Like I think there's a new one possibly on my Flynn line. Maybe that'll break open. That would be nice to right. see that, you know, so it's yeah. there's always a chance. That's what I love about it, that more, more people are seeing this. And I think these challenges are kind of showing people like the power of the collaboration, how we, yeah. can, how we can do this. Yeah. And then the, the quiet challenges as well, like, um, you know, every month a number of projects just have a connection project of their own and say, uh, you know, how many African Americans can we add to the tree uh, this month, you know, is one that goes on every month. And I and I know a number of the other projects are the same, you know, or let's all go look at this cemetery in Boston, you know, and get all the people on WikiTree. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Our community makes a big difference. Uh, you know, it's not a, an experience you're going to find elsewhere and very powerful. Yeah, we had a, a member, Nicole, who joined uh, the, the day before the challenge it was her first day on Wikitree. And luckily, she's a UX uh, designer. So she she's used to thinking about how software works. But, uh, um, you know, she had a lot of just learning curve hurdles to cross, but she's excited about just living in Vermont. And, oh, I want to find the people from this challenge who are from Vermont so I could just drive to the place and take photos or, or go to the um, historical society and do sure. some in-person re research. That's really cool. I really cool. love that. And I'd like to give a plug out for, for this challenge because I think it was great. So any organization out there, please, Get in touch with you know oh, Mindy, Mindy and the team though, because if you've ever been wondering about you know you know some of the founders or any important people in your organization, it's a great way to just learn more and get your members involved and you know and just like I said, just kind of tell about your organization in that regard right. too. I think it's I think it's a win win on everyone's side, and you know I think it's it's so much fun doing these, and and you're always surprising us more and more with each of these challenges. So yeah, I know. Um North of Ireland Family History Society picked up at least two new members um, from the wiki treers working with them. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see uh, some new members for you as well. When, when people get, yeah, go look at the website and see all of the great collections of silver books and all the great uh, online resources that you have, you know. Absolutely. If anybody wants to get in touch with us, feel free to reach out to us, whether it's email, Discord, you know, we're happy to help. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you again, Melanie and David. <clears throat> it is always a pleasure to me to be able to work with you guys anyways. You're like family now that you've done the tree challenge. And now you've done it twice, you can say. So. No, I know, I know. That is a trick. <laughs> wow. Record breaking in more ways than one. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No. So, um, you know, I, I look forward to seeing what everybody does when they finish these branches. And certainly if you have any questions about anything you find out there, you know how to reach me and, you know, just reach out. And if I don't know the answer, I will find it. So it's just been an incredible week. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both of you and to everybody that's been healthy on this challenge. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Good time. Yeah.